Okay, thanks. Um, so our two moderators for our first panel, <clears throat> excuse me, are Rex Chisholm and Renee Ryder. Uh, you've already heard, uh, let's see, let's start getting messages from the system. <laughs> um, Rex is a professor of medical genetics in the Feinberg School of Medicine and was the founding director of the Center for Genetic Medicine at Northwestern. He's a member of the Genomic Medicine Working Group and a, a very deeply engaged in um, the Emerge Network research. And um, he's in, in the perfect position to facilitate this discussion because he's, his research is really focused on how basically to uh, have genomics informed personalized medicine um, in the care, in care delivery settings. And then Renee Ryder is a genetic counselor and the program and the newly hired program director for the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, she's uh, for the Implementing Genomics in Practice Pragmatic Trials Network or IGNITE. And as you've already heard, Renee has been one of the key people in helping make this meeting possible. So a personal thank you to, to Renee as well. All right, Rex and Renee. Hi, thank you so much. I wanted to welcome you today to session one, which is laying the groundwork. This session will have two speakers, which will be followed by a discussion panel. Throughout the session, please feel free to use the chat feature to engage with, you, with each other. However, if you have a question that you'd like the speakers to respond to, please put that in the Q&A. After each of the talks today, we will pause briefly for clarifying questions, but we ask that you hold the big questions and discussion for the panel section of this um, session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Peter Hewlett from North Shore University Health Center, who will speak on the state of genomic learning healthcare systems. Terrific, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and uh, help uh, set the stage for this 14th uh, gathering of genomics medicine. Um, let's get the slides up. I'm very excited to help uh, set the stage here. Um, as mentioned by Renee, I am um, outside of Chicago at North Shore University, his, uh, North Shore University Health System. Uh, a learning healthcare system and implementation is dear to my heart. And I look forward to uh, hearing all the great things that come out of this conference to help us move the world of genomics in the healthcare systems uh, forward. Again, laying out the objectives, exploring the real world examples of how genomic learning healthcare systems can apply cycles of genomic medicine and implementation to bring uh, dis uh, evaluation and adjust and implement practices across delivery systems. Again, the examining the barriers and identifying potential solutions. Really wanna look at the opportunities here, not look at barriers as something that we should run away from and really develop solutions. And that comes from collaborations and listening to others and how they tackle problems. There really isn't one solution. And as we work towards as a goal together, we can really bring this field forward. So the challenge is why do we really need a genomics learning health system? Personalized profiles and disease risk really must capture all facets of, of health, genomic information included. The reality is there's an exponential growth of health data and we are under a deluge of data. And how do we re really bring it together to provide these inputs and discover insights that we may have blinders to and really validate them and then activate around them so that we can provide the best care possible for our patients and learn as we implement. So where are we? How are we learning? Well, this is certainly a learning health system uh, concept really has started taking off if you use publications as a proxy. Really, this is somewhat of a lagging type of uh, marker, but it does show there is gaining interest. And this is critical because we need this inertia to really move the field forward and start to take advantage of all this data we are collecting. We are in a data generation mode of medicine, and really we have to start separating the noise from what really matters in terms of the care of our patients and providing the best next step and simplify it so that physicians and other caregivers can know what is that next best thing that I should do for my patient. So what defines a learning health system? Well, there are different um, ways to describe it, but a really a health system which internal data, and I would argue also taking external data and experiences are systematically integrated within uh, external evidence. And that knowledge is put into practice. As a result, patients get a higher quality, safer, and more efficient care, and health delivery organizations become better places to work as well. 
streamlining all facets in terms of, of improvement of healthcare delivery. This process doesn't happen overnight, though there have certainly been stressors over the past few years where it feels like it needed to. Um, it needs to be an iterative process to continually improve. And it requires partnerships, not just clinical partnerships, but across the domains um, um, and moving away from a culture that's just business as usual. It really takes all stakeholders engaged and coming with that common goal. How do we learn from our experiences and apply them directly back into patient care? So elements of a learning system is having that leaders who are committed to that culture. It can't though just be top down. It has to be something that has some grassroots to it as, as well. And really we have to be able to systemically gather and apply evidence in ideally real time to guide care. Um, this requires new and novel um, um, IT methods to incorporate that evidence. Um, we need to include um, patients as part of the system as their vital members, because ultimately this is why we're doing it, to help improve patient care. So they need to have buy-in, because we also need and recognize that there's data sharing elements and patients need to have a voice in that. Capturing and analyzing this data in different episodes of care um, is necessary. And then that continuous feedback, you know, how do you refine the process? How do you train the algorithms? How do you make sure that this is really working for every patient within a system, regardless of what their background is. So a learning health system doesn't fit into one size um, all. There are different components to it. In the traditional model of, of, of clinical care, you, you try to make a diagnosis and then the uh, uh, care team, the physician makes a treatment decision. But now we are starting to move into more of a, a comprehensive data model and then trying to apply real-time techniques to start to gather this. And a large process of this has been the adoption of the electronic health re record, creating uh, data elements that are po portable, different standardizations like OMOP models, et cetera, and really start to hone in on how do we aggregate this data and start to build that evidence. A lot of times we look at it retrospectively and this needs to be filtered back into the treatment decision over time. As we all know, dissemination of guidelines and uptake of guidelines can take years, if not decades, to really reach that. So how do we really start to move into this real-time aspect of a learning health system and really start to recalibrate our treatment algorithms, our treatment care plans based on real-world evidence um, that is well-vetted and that can be deployed um, at the point of care, and then ultimately um, really have that um, standardization across not just an individual organization, but across multiple organizations as we start to share this experience. The comprehensive data model or learning health system is also viewed as a first step, mainly because it is reliant and is driven by the data that's in the electronic health uh, record. When you think about it, so North Shore is on Epic, um, there are over um, 162 million patients with 5.7 billion encounters in, in patients all across the United States. When you think about the US health system, in terms of what is that potential? What is that data? How can we best utilize this? And this is just one um, electronic health record uh, vendor. These tend to resemble uh, longitudinal cohort studies. So again, we have the opportunity to see how things develop over time and start to learn, well, what inputs could inform our learning health system and how do we build on that? This was critical, certainly when we were going through the COVID pandemic and, and are we still trying to figure out what is our way out of that and trying to understand, well, what is the impact and looking at this data to see how can we better position ourselves to improve care when there frankly were a lot of unknowns on how best to manage um, the pandemic. Um, this is critically important in getting as real-time evidence as possible out there so that our clinical teams could make their appropriate decisions and then be able to take a look back and say, you know, let's take another look at, it. are we making an impact, which is critical because as we implement, if we're not having the desired effect, we need to see that signal. Or if there's another way to enhance it, we need to be able to iterate and continue on that process. And the pandemic really highlighted that need. The challenge is how do you speed this up and do it in a safe and effective way in quote unquote real time, whether it's instantaneous or on a, on a daily updated basis or monthly, uh, but increase that speed of iteration. This really builds on early clinical decision support system, so that medication errors, drug drug interactions, et cetera, which some can argue can be white noise, but there are value in, in, in these alerts 
when they are at the right time in the, and with the right information so the patient can have the right decision made for their care. Moving this data generated through the clinical care beyond just observable rate research is key. We need to actually apply it, not just observe and report, although that's a critical first step, and use it to impute for uh, these algorithms so that we can better be better effective with um, our care. Oncology certainly has served as an early opportunity um, for this in terms of patient journeys, looking at, well, my patient doesn't exactly fit a clinical trial, but I can see what's happened to other patients who were treated with similar circumstances in terms of their comorbidities or other um, aspects of their health uh, care and determine what happened if I'm trying to prioritize what treatments might be more effective or um, better in line with the patient's goals of care. The key to this is traveling, uh, is translating these novel insights from clinical care of prior patients directly back into patient management. And in, in, in some instances, generating new hypotheses of what is the best care approach. In the full learning health system, is so, sort of the holy grail is also building in some randomization so that it actually becomes, in essence, a prospective interventional trial so that you can really test in a rigorous way did that outcome really um, improve with our proposed intervention. Again, the COVID pandemic really highlighted how this was important to really implement overnight. It forced some institutions to really say, we need to adapt this uh, now and was a real catalyst. Um, and certainly um, this led to some very novel insights um, that helped us um, try to get ahead of the curve in terms of creating the pandemic. And so in some ways, this um, has an opportunity to help us as a learning health systems in general adopt this methodology, but then now we can start to think about it in the uh, care involving genomics as, as well. So where are we with this in terms of what's been done, what's been studied, what works? Well, a recent review attempted to look at this and see, well, how did learning health systems effectively work? What was the empirical evidence that this really did improve care? And there were a number of different um, um, aspects of what these studies focused on, but most were focused on a specific disease or clinical context, which made sense. We have to take uh, stepping stones towards implementing as opposed to a broad, just across pan health approach to a learning um, health system. Uh, the graph here really shows that, you know, each circle here represents a node or keyword in terms of what was the focus. Not surprising, learning health system, given the scoping of trying to figure out well, where are we involved with learning health systems, and the electronic health records um, come up to the surface here. The HR is generally the primary where we're going to get this data in terms of how do we implement um, a learning health system type of care model. But as you can see, there are other um, reported um, um, outcomes of what they were trying to assess, whether it's um, evidence-based policies, whether it's public opinion and trust, um, testing out machine learning techniques, all these are important. But I think what was notable is that there really were a limited number that incorporated the implementation of some sort of um, implementation science framework. So that seems to be an area of opportunity where how do we make sure that we're um, appropriately measuring the effectiveness of these learning health system environments. Um, and the challenge there has been traditionally these mixed methods um, approaches have been very labor and, and, and intensive in terms of, and resource intensive in terms of deploying. But we are starting to see novel um, ways of incorporating them, which hopefully will make it easier for us to learn from other examples in the reported literature of what worked, why it didn't work, and also um, lessons learned from stakeholders and input so we can actually avoid making mistakes that other people unfortunately had to tackle and overcome in the first go round. So the takeaways in the learning health system um, scoping in general is that the implementation is increasing and there is an opportunity here to use that implementation framework to make it more robust so that we can really translate these innovations at certain institutions into uh, other organizations and really understand more the how and the why the success or the lack of the success occurred. That's equally important. We need to you know, fail fast if we're going to fail and implement on that. COVID-19 just underscores the need for these types of environments and the use cases will only grow over time. So then we talk about a genomic learning healthcare system. So is it just simply just adding genomics and everything will be fine? 
Well, as this group is well aware of, that's unfortunately not the case. There are other aspects um, that um, make some additional challenges of genomics, but I argue we need to continue to walk away from that genetic exceptionalism approach. Um, the good news here is we do see more and more academic and community uh, centers incorporating genomics information as dis discrete data. That's sort of a, a no-brainer foundation that we need to occur. We are starting to see um, this evolution of more data donor culture where um, both patients and health systems are getting more comfortable with using data in, in more novel ways. And now we start to look at, well, how can we start to make the scalable decision support tools, the knowledge content that's effective all across the organizations, really start to understand how do we make this um, interoperability problem um, go away or at least be reduced? Because unfortunately, a large part of this is be being reinvented at each organization. And then finally, seeing those implementation wins carry out will help guide this process forward and really help other systems who may be on the fence of, uh, of going into a genomics learning health system kind of model um, uh, tip over to the edge. So just uh, describing how complicated this can be. This is an example from our own institution where we had a number of use cases where we knew we would need to have genomic data integrated in the EHR to start to work on building towards that um, that uh, learning health system genomics guided goal. Um, so we have use cases that we were taking raw um, next gen sequencing data off our own sequencers. We had our PGX data that could, could, could come from in-house or externally. And then we had our population primary care after our DNA 10K where this data needed to come across um, and be integrated into our platforms as well as our clinical decision support. And the relationship of this, for example, when a patient would have a result come back from um, Color Genomics, which um, was our partner for the DNA 10K project, the report came in, had to go to the EHR, went to our um, variant re uh, repository, our different bioinformatics um, clinical decision support areas to really bring it back out so that we could use it in a discrete way, and it is informed in the EHR in terms of care pathways and other downstream patient care activities. And this is really critical. If you look at pharmacogenomics as a proxy in our system of incorporation of genomics information, it is really uh, um, taking off um, dramatically with some of our efforts. And um, not surprisingly, it's coming from different data sources as, as well. So um, on the positive side, you know, we have crossed now over 25,000 patients who have discrete data in our system. However, when you think of the scope of the number of patient lives North Shore takes care of, we still have a ways to go in terms of having genomics guiding patient care for everyone. But this is really criti critical as although probably 99% of our pharmacogenomics testing occurs in the primary care setting, where the encounters are being um, um, had in, across our system, where patients have this information in the system, um, at least 50%, if not more, is occurring outside of primary care and all across our organization. So this interoperability within our health system is critical if we're really going to have gen uh, genomics guided care and in the setting of a learning health system. And then when you even look further where this cl clinical decision support is fired, it's even more of a mosaic care of the different um, areas within our organization where this, this information is, is, is firing. So a critical need as we look at data, data is being generated all across our organization and we need to harness that and start to help feed that into the algorithms that um, move our care forward in a, in a logical and patient um, uh, um, perspective or a patient friendly manner. So how do we gauge the incorporation of genomics into healthcare systems? There's not just a, a single measurement, um, you know, standard tool that says, okay, you have 90% incorporation. So using personalized medicine and programs that have decided they wanted to adopt a personalized medicine program, um, this is uh, in some instance, a proxy for genomics incorporation because those um, that are typically wanting to put genomic information discreetly into their health system, have some sort of personalized medicine model or precision medicine model across. And so I thought um, in the Personal Medicine Coalition, um, they put out this framework looking at where these adoption approaches are occurring anywhere from the range of healthy patient screening to rare undiagnosed diseases and then the continuum in, in between. And looking at, well, where are they in this journey of, a, of, of genomics adoption and uh, personalized medicine? And we see of the organizations that have identified that there is an interest or appear to have an interest and they are implementing, 
Certainly this is not all encompassing, but it gives us a spectrum. And I think the key takeaway here is there is interest and it seems to be evolving and for, but there is no one who is probably, or there's very few institutions who are quote unquote doing it across the spectrum at the same um, depth of, of integration. And so there are gonna be different learnings depending on where an organization is and where they uh, choose to um, embark on their initial efforts of getting genomics into the EHR and building that uh, clinical decision support, that learning health system around uh, their um, disease interests. So is the glass full or half empty when we think about the progress of a genomics health learning system? Well, on the half full side, um, we do see implementation continues to gain traction, and we are starting to see new tools tailored to this development um, to help us understand better the why and how things worked or did not work, and importantly, in a focus on incorporating genomics into the EGR. Personalized medicine continues to gain traction and interest both from clinicians and administration, but also patients, importantly, as well. COVID-19 pandemic did highlight some sec successes, but it also highlights some gaps um, in terms of where we are in this process. We still have to understand, you know, how can we better adopt um, implementation science framework so we can better relay why things worked or didn't work and help others who are just starting on this journey learn from prior experience and also inform us what are next steps for those organizations who are for further along in this process. The reporting of outcomes and implementation methods still remains a, a barrier to identify this important insight. Genomics information does add a layer of complexity to privacy and data concerns if we talk about the scalability and interoperability across organizations. And then finally, there is a variety of ways that genomics is being incorporated in the approaches organizations are taking in terms of personalized or precision medicine, which ultimately is a somewhat of an early proxy for genomics guide learning healthcare systems. But I take the approach that, you know, technically the glass is always full. It's just, what are your ingredients? What are your components of a program? And to me, a genomics learning health system is, is just that we have to take those initial steps. Each of us are using different ingredients, but the themes are the same and we're moving the field forward. And I really um, look forward to uh, this conference to better understand what others are doing and also to share in the, in the dialogue of how we can make this work. And so hopefully we continue this progress that we've made in the learning health system. So I appreciate again, the organizers for inviting me to help um, set the stage for uh, this 14th conference. And I look forward to the next uh, two days of dialogue and, and presentations. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Peter. That was a great overview. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. There was one that was put in the Q&A earlier uh, that asked the question, how do you address the quality of EMR data? Longitudinal cohorts often have strict data collection standards. EHR data collection is entered by multiple individuals in a healthcare system and more variability and not the same level of standardization. Do, do you want to have a few comments on that? Uh, you're still on mute, I think. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Yes. So um, quality of the EMR data is uh, critical. I think part of this depends on, well, what problem are you, are you trying to, to solve? So some of the initial things in the learning health system, what we did is we implemented some of our primary care programs um, initiatives. We started to look at what were the some of the operational barriers and delivery of care barriers. So there's a different um, level of quality in terms of um, we could see different trends that why one site may be uh, uh, performing better than others. Um, was it simply, you know, a question of uh, patients didn't know what the next step was? I mean, sometimes it can be as simple effort as that. Um, as far as getting people to the next step, we noticed there was a lack of follow through in some of our, our breast, high risk breast cancer referrals. And we were trying to figure that out. But when we went and looked at our data, we saw it was something as simple as that. We had an over aggressive uh, um, schedule that if they only called once and they didn't get a response from the patient, they removed them from the queue, which wasn't part of our process of how many times in the ways we reach out to patients. As you start to get um, um, more downstream in terms of um, the rigor that's needed in terms of implementing care, does someone have that breast MRI or what was found on it? Um, 
was uh, uh, an earlier detection of a cancer made possible screening for um, unrecognized disease, then it starts to, you start to have to have more robust um, uh, parameters on the data that you're extracting and not just um, necessarily relying on discrete data, but also taking unstructured data out of progress notes. And that's where I think the field is really starting to advance as well. And I think certainly things like machine learning are going to help a lot with improving improving that. We've got another question from Alexander Reykjavik, who says, are physicians buying into the clinical utility of your efforts? Uh, again, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, again, this is something that is an evolution. Um, the, we started probably too top heavy in our experience. Um, and then we started to kind of, um, as we learned in some of the work that Amy Lemke has done for our organization, we looked at some of the barriers to implementation uh, using some mixed method results. And we found that we really needed to engage a wider net of stakeholders um, for this process improvement. And we created something called the Genomic Ambassadors where we have initially, it was about 10 primary care physicians who were early adopters. So we had to identify the early adopters and we, had them um, commit to an hour per month, a combination of education on genomics in general, what the goals, where we're trying to go. And, um, and then we started to teach them how to talk to their peers in terms of conveying this information to get buy-in. And we've, we've seen this culture change. Um, is everyone 100% on board? No, but we've certainly come a long way um, over the past really five to six years we've been working on this. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I, I think we can go ahead and move on to the next uh, presentation. So Renee, I'll let you introduce the next speaker. You're on mute, Renee. Sorry. Next up, we have Terry Manolio from NHGRA who will give an overview of the genomic learning healthcare system barriers. Great, thank you, Renee um, and Rex. So um, I did want to mention, I forgot to say it when I was describing the overview of our meetings. Very often before these meetings, we'll uh, do a, a survey of the people who are presenting or attending in that. Uh, typically we do these through, through Duke, which ran uh, this one and we appreciate that. Just to find out a little bit more about the state of you know, what, what people are, are working on or, cha or challenges they're encountering in this space. Um, and so we did that in this case, we wanted to gather information from existing genomic learning healthcare systems that we were aware of. And, and I have to say that's a, a small universe and I'm sure we missed um, others that, that would have fit perfectly in here. And so our apologies for that. Um, we didn't get complete response, you know, a, a, a terrific, a, a perfect response rate, but we did pretty well. Um, and we wanted to gather information on how their system is organized, how genomic information is integrated into it, and again, what barriers they're running into and what solutions, very importantly, um, they found, especially to genomic data integration. And then we use those responses to help plan for these meetings, uh, for this meeting to share experiences and identify opportunities. Uh, the 10 groups that responded are, are listed uh, below there. Um, We've kind of, you know, masked the uh, the institution information because it it, it isn't that Im it's very important, but it's it's not critical to the goals of of uh, our our discussion here. So so that's masked, but you'll see there uh, the the various results. So um, we asked about uh, enterprise wide EHRs. We had the impression that if uh, a system was doing this, that they must have an enterprise-wide EHR. And it turns out that uh, not necessarily. Um, some were in development, some were in selected systems, some were incomplete. Um, and in, uh, in, in kind of summary of that, there were only four that had system-wide uh, EHRs, what they described as, as that four in selected places and two uh, had incomplete um, uh, development of, of those. You can see the EHRs used, uh, I think reflective of the, the US um, ecosphere at the at the present time. Um, seven groups used Epic, one used Cerner, and two used multiple systems. Um, and I think one one uh, takeaway from this is that that if we want to do useful and effective uh, implementation of genomic learning healthcare systems using EHRs, we need to engage with these um, um, uh, EHR. Um, producers. So, and then uh, a variety of, uh, you know, whether they included structured genomic data, seven said yes, three said no. 
Uh, we also asked about what evaluation metrics and what framework uh, frameworks they were using. You can see that uh, many of them, but not all, uh, uh, assessed health outcomes, almost all assessed uh, process outcomes, um, uh, several measures of satisfaction, including two groups that looked at it for uh, health systems and one that looked at it for researchers. Um, many looked at health system costs. Um, one that didn't have uh, process metrics yet, and then the frameworks that were used um, were the, some of the uh, those that we've heard of and we'll hear more of uh, today, CIFR and REAIM, um, others uh, not necessarily using a framework or using other frameworks. We also asked about gaps in expertise in genomic medicine. Um, I I think it's fair to say that probably all of us recognize in all of our systems, we have gaps everywhere. So we said, you know, give us your top two. So uh, you can see here, uh, genomic educators and informaticians were, were really, and again, these numbers are very, very small, but so those, those kind of won by one person um, and uh, genetic counselors and medical geneticists were not far behind, again, not surprising. Uh, and then people with expertise in genomic medicine, interestingly, pharmacogenetics experts, I, I think is that's an area that, that we may have addressed or it, at least it's been addressed better than some of the other shortages. And we have, um, you know, we can offer many thanks to schools of pharmacy and, and other groups uh, that have really taken this on, uh, the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium or CPIC, uh, the Pharmacogenomics uh, Research Network, and others that have, have really taken on uh, trying to, to uh, get pharmacogenomics implemented in clinical care. That's not to say that that expertise isn't needed in many places, but it's not one of the sort of top five, at least as judged by these 10 groups. Um, we asked about, well, okay, so you have these gaps, what are your approaches for filling them? And, and the emphasis is mine here, the, the bold blue um, are, are just things that sort of jumped out to me. Um, and one had, had to do with a, a genomic medicine track in an in internal medicine residency. And so you'll hear about one such track uh, uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and a genomic ambassador forum, which seemed like a, a really interesting idea. Uh, I don't know if we'll be hearing more about that today, but that would be our today or tomorrow um, of, of 12 primary care physicians sounded sort of like a focus group almost. Um, and established uh, that one group established its own genetic counselor training program uh, uh, as, as one solution. Um, and um, some groups are, are growing their own uh, in terms of adult medical geneticists and genomic medicine experts, but they're, you know, they're having trouble getting, getting appropriate candidates. So something else we can, we can talk about. Uh, and an, another group uh, established a dis dissemination implementation science in omics unit uh, to study models supporting translation to clinic. So some interesting uh, approaches to filling gaps in expertise. I so said we weren't going to talk about barriers and obstacles. I only show this slide because, again, we asked people to give us their sort of top two obstacles so that we could then go and say, okay, what solutions have you uh, implemented to address those? Education of patients and uh, clinicians and systems, uh, as well as bioinformatics infrastructure, were the top two, again, by only one sort of one vote. But that you know, goes along with what we saw previously in terms of the, the uh, expertise gaps. Uh, and you can see also that close behind was acceptance by uh, patients, clinicians, and systems and a shortage of genetic counselors. So, okay, so how are you addressing those barriers? And again, a, a large number of, of potential solutions. Uh, one that, that uh, I believe we'll be hearing a little bit later about were automated care navigation pathways. So can you can you automate at least some steps in the process to, to simplify it and, and reduce the sort of human person burden? Um, in education and counseling, um, it, this wasn't a solution as much as, as sort of a, you know, cry for help is difficult for any system to create original educational content. Although there are groups now that are doing that, the ISCC is, is one source of it, and there are uh, other places that we can talk about. Uh, another group was working, also working on educational programs. We need to bring those groups together and share this information. Um, we also need a sustainable model for that because if you can't charge for it, it's not clear you know, how else it's going to get paid for. And if you charge for it, then you're less willing to share. Um, in terms of uh, acceptance in bioinformatics, developing a shared uh, evidence knowledge base and literature archive is, is a solution that one group either has implemented or is suggesting that we try to implement. 
um, and um, diverse multi-institutional cohorts uh, were suggested as a great way of generating evidence. We would uh, agree and as well um, uh, recognize genomic data as a longitudinal health resource that can follow the patient uh, from care source, source to care source and, and should do that and currently does not. Um, and then potentially novel education models, a few of them are listed there and we may hear about them. That's the last slide, it is. So I will stop sharing and uh, turn it back to you, Rex and Renee. Thanks so much, Terry. Um, next, we're gonna move on to the discussion panel section of the session. We're gonna ask each of our panelists to just make a few short opening remarks and then we're going to open it up for discussion. So our first panelist that we're gonna have is Guy Hanan from the Desert Research Institute. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to start with the obvious and that uh, not, um, not all our projects are alike. And um, it's very important that when you design and plan your project that you do it in the context of the community and the sponsoring organizations that uh, <clears throat> you have. And it requires constant reevaluation. Our model here at the Health in Nevada project in uh, Northern Nevada was patient empowerment at the start of the project. Basically, we provided um, the finding, positive findings to the participants. And uh, we, along with consultation and recommended act, detailed recommended actions, and we trusted the participants to uh, access their primary, uh, their physicians and act upon the findings. What we found, which is not a big surprise probably, that only about 70% of the participants actually acted upon their, uh, upon their findings. And there is an attrition in execution in every step along the way. Um, one thing that we found that contributes to a lot of attrition in execution is that healthcare personnel are very uncomfortable dealing with genomic findings. And it's the whole spectrum of genomics findings. We provided, we did the testing, we provided the results, but they are quite uncomfortable with ordering genetic testing, um, interpreting the results, conveying the results to, uh, to their patients and acting upon them. And it really affects the outcomes of the project. Um, the way we uh, designed our project, uh, when we delivered results, there was a notification process and a consultation by genetic counselors. And genetic counselors are not that easy to come by. Um, initially, at the beginning of our project, we used our own genetic counselors, and our notification and consultation success rate was about 90% of all the positive uh, participants with positive findings. Eventually, we switched to a... Uh, third party vendor, and despite using the exact same, supposedly the same exact protocol, the notification and consultation rate uh, became only uh, slightly above 60%. Huge drop in uh, execution, um, which we understand by the way, that it is kind of the um, industry standard in terms of uh, success rate. Um, we are currently, as a result of this, considering other ways of supplementing or improving that notification success rate, because it really does affect the bottom line of execution. Um, additionally, we found that eventually when you look at the electronic health record, you find a very low rate of documentation of the findings, especially in the problem list. We found that only about 10% of the medical records of our positive finding participants actually reflected um, very specific genetic diagnosis for those uh, individuals. We also found that there is a higher rate of uh, diagnosis that appear in other, possibly in other sections of the electronic health record, but that was not higher than about 25%. And many of the diagnoses were, were, were very non-specific diagnoses. Um, which basically affect the utilization of the findings because if I have, we report on uh, HBOC, Lynch, and familial hypercholesterolemia, but if you assign a diagnosis that says uh, a tendency for uh, cancer, it is not very helpful in, uh, for providers down the road to actually act upon it. Um, in terms of actually finding improvement in care, 
Um, we only found actually when we looked into the medical record uh, only anecdotal uh, evidence that actually even the patient that had specific documentation in the medical record actually had any evidence of effective uh, follow-up in terms of the risk. And as, all of, as a result of all of this, we have a lot of missed opportunities. Um, one of the missed opportunities is that Many of our participants, uh, because of the voluntary nature of our project, actually were detected at a relatively later age, and as a result, already had a presentation um, of the uh, outcomes of their condition. Um, obviously, if you are designing a project like this and you want to maximize the yield, the yield of your effort, um, recruit, se selecting the patients that are going to be recruited may be very relevant to maximize that. Uh, to maximize that. Um, and we also found that as a result of the fact that um, physicians mostly feel uncomfortable with executing and acting upon ge uh, genomic results, that this is required, as has been mentioned already here multiple times, um, decision support system, but it's not enough just to present the finding within the electronic health record. We took care initially of educating and uh, all the, provi the providers within the organization and primary care about the project and about the action that they should take. But we found out that this requires constant uh, renewal and hand-holding and follow-up about the actions that were taken. Um, and this is uh, very briefly about the uh, uh, findings from the Healthy Nevada project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. Next, we're going to introduce Bruce Korf from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. All right, well, thank you. Um, so I'm going to very quickly tell you about a um, implementation project that we've been doing um, here in Birmingham um, called the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative which is a state supported project that is a collaboration of UAB and Hudson Alpha in Huntsville. It's in its fifth year now. Um, and initially we were doing a population-based enrollment and returning results of secondary findings from the ACMG list with genetic counseling provided. But we used the, um, the um, COVID hiatus in enrollment as an opportunity to um, pivot our approach because we didn't feel we were reaching the, um, the physician community and healthcare provider community as much as the population. So we initiated a um, collaboration with Family Medicine at UAB, which had expressed an interest in genomics. Um, we um, deployed a group of, um, of study staff to work with the staff in Family Medicine. The covenant with them was that um, we would not complicate or, um, or um, add time to the workflow of, of their kind of activities. Uh, we also convened a community advisory board to get input from the patient community, which continues to meet. Um, we generated a workflow that would minimize disruption to the family medicine staff and um, implemented this, I guess it was June of um, 2021, so a little bit more than a year ago. Um, we return secondary findings now, pathogenic and likely path results, to participants and to their provider um, who orders this test. And um, the um, individuals who wind up with uh, actionable findings, which is about 1% so far, are then referred to an appropriate clinic at UAB for continued care. Um, in addition, uh, we now return pharmacogenetic data um, which is generated at Hudson Alpha. It's reviewed by a team of pharmacogenetic pharmacists led by Nita Limdi, who also have access to the medication list for each participant. And ultimately then they issue a report to the participant that is a sort of general report, um, really designed so it does not encourage them to make individual changes of medications. And then a more specific report to their physician who then is guided in terms of what may be relevant changes based on the pharmacogenetic profile. And a landing place for the pharmacogenetic data and the genomic data has been developed in the electronic health record, which is a Cerner-based system, but it's not structured, honestly. It's more of a PDF-based system for right now. 
Uh, we have an implementation science project underway right now um, to look at outcomes. Um, we also, um, about 90% of participants agree to share their data for research purposes. It goes into the I2B2 database and has been used by a number of investigators at UAB, and we're using it to take a look at results we don't return for various reasons to get a sense of what the correlation of genotype and at least phenotype as recorded in the EHR is. In our first year, 557 enrolled, of which 69% were people historically underrepresented in biomedical research. About a third had a result that could affect their current medications, and 1%, as I mentioned before, had an actionable result. Um, the challenges we've run into, um, some of the clinics, uh, we have one in Birmingham, one in Hoover, which is near Birmingham, one in Selma, are especially the Hoover one, still mostly telemedicine, um, which is a bit of a challenge. The enrollments are done um, by our staff getting a list of patients coming into clinic the next day. Uh, they're contacted by phone. They can be consented that way, although many of them are consented when they actually show up in the, um, in the um, clinical office. Um, we really aren't yet to the point of full EHR integration. We've had very good physician engagement, but not 100%. And um, we've had instances where a, a change in medication was suggested, and it would turn out to be unclear exactly really who had originally prescribed it and, and trying to track that down and figure out how to make the changes has also been a challenge. So I will stop there and um, thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Bruce. Next, we have Casey Overby-Taylor from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Hi, thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, a learning healthcare system uh, can be considered broadly as an environment where biomedical innovations, including genomics, can enter the clinic before they're optimized, and then refinements can be made through those continuous feedback loops. And so for my, my current focus, I've been fortunate to be able to interact with, this, with several genetic professionals at my institution, and uh, have, they've helped me to realize that that feedback loop has been in place for a long time for patients that are, be, that are getting whole genome and whole exome sequencing. Uh, for example, the tests uh, may uh, be performed for, some, for, for a patient that's presently undiagnosed or those so-called diagnostic odysseys. And in some cases, they may remain undiagnosed at the time of initial testing, but then at a later date, we may have enough evidence to better interpret the patient results, and then they can be assigned a diagnosis. And so that process really is that genomic learning healthcare system feedback loop that is very familiar to uh, genetic counselors. And so as uh, part of my uh, Genomic Innovator Award that, that funds my, my research largely, I've been working with collaborators to really better understand this process of monitoring and following up with patients that have genomic results, and also identifying opportunities for technology to help to facilitate that process. And the initial focus in designing and building technology has been around uh, supporting genetic counselors and notifying them of at an optimal time and with the appropriate information to support following up on genetic test results over time. And uh, so what I've learned so far and uh, some points I wanna bring up to consider in this panel um, first, uh, and this is a point that's been brought up a couple times already, uh, but EHR documentation is really critical and it influences the extent to which technology can be helpful at several points in, the, in this uh, uh, following up process. Uh, so with the current data availability for our project, we are able to support one feedback loop, which is really to review uh, test results for, of patients um, at a set amount of time, after a set amount of time passes. Um, though ideally we'd wanna be able to implement more targeted rules for when new evidence is relevant for a set of patients. So that requires having uh, structured uh, test results to be able to, to do that. And um, I know some of, the, um, some of the sites are able to, to do this, but there's kind of different levels depending on uh, documentation that, uh, that's available as structured or unstructured. The second point is, uh, we want to design for a team of care providers. And um, you know, as I mentioned, we focus on tasks of genetic counselors, but they're one part of the patient's clinical team. And there may be um, ancillary systems that are part of this genomic learning healthcare system 
um, the, the entire ecosystem. And I see that the EHR is the common thread between the care team. So while we're working on a solution for genetic counselors, initially there's some areas where we're, we're seeking broader input um, um, with respect to uh, where actionable information gets documented in the EHR and who is notified and when, you know, outside of the genetic counselors themselves. Uh, the third point is uh, considering release, release software is just a start. And this is related to the objective of the meeting on uh, having ways to be uh, for solutions to be developed and shared. So for our solution, we haven't used this in like an agile method of software development, but we have made some practical choices for what we can release as part of a minimal viable product that um, offers the software's most essential features. And, and doing this allows us to get feedback before expanding the scope further. And the reason why I'm including this point is because doing this has some initial drawbacks. And uh, for example, uh, you may not be able to fully leverage data standards uh, right away. And, uh, but I'd argue that resources to leverage those standards uh, become more, more uh, possible after demonstrating value as stakeholders. So uh, in some, uh, we focus on genetic counseling uh, and uh, these points are, however, pos uh, potentially relevant for genomic learning healthcare system solutions more broadly. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thanks so much, Casey. And last, we've got, last but not least, Adam Buchanan from Geisinger. Thanks, Renee. Great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. So I heard a lot of uh, similarities uh, described already with the work that we're doing at Geisinger. I'll focus on our work within our large biobank that's reporting secondary or actionable findings uh, to uh, individuals using a list that's really similar to the ACMG secondary findings list. And um, <clears throat> I think some of the highlights that have already been stressed today have, have uh, been consistent with our experience as well. The importance of using implementation science frameworks like REAIM, as uh, my colleagues, Alana Rahm and Lainey Jones have uh, pointed out and written about, has been really key for understanding not just uh, whether the particular health outcomes that uh, we hope will occur when we introduce some genetic information into care, uh, whether those occur, but actually how those occur and what conditions are most likely to encourage them to occur. Uh, we've also noticed that uh, the more that we think about uh, reporting those genomic information, uh, those data points in a way that fits into the flow of care, uh, the more likely we are to be able to see some of those health outcomes happen. So. We've seen uh, some similar experiences to what uh, Guy described in terms of suboptimal uptake of risk management after reporting an actionable result. Uh, we've dug into that a little bit more and uh, uh, in, in many ways, it's very similar to what's been known for lots of uh, screening behaviors in medicine for a long time. It's multifactorial and often takes multiple different types of interventions to move uh, particular patients all, all the way to realizing that intervention. So uh, what that's meant to us is that the more that we tap into some of those existing systems within the healthcare system that think about uh, leveraging some risk information and using it to uh, close loops in care, the more likely we are to actually fit into the regular uh, practice of medicine that goes on at Geisinger. So one example of that <clears throat> is that we have a care coordination group that uh, works with a lot of patients with uh, complex or chronic illnesses. And that group is really a support network for those patients that uh, helps them uh, stay on with uh, measuring, if they want to see measurement, for example, uh, and other processes to uh, manage those complex illnesses. Uh, they support the frontline clinicians in doing that work. So the frontline clinicians uh, are not quite as overburdened by having to do that longitudinal management. And uh, that's a, uh, a mechanism that can be tapped into by our genomics team as well uh, in thinking about the risk that we're identifying through both our biobank and through other programs as something that needs to be managed long-term. So uh, to points that have made, been made already, the, that genomic information is necessary to understand something about somebody's medical risk, but it's certainly not sufficient for changing health behavior, uh, for completely understanding that risk overall in the context of the rest of that uh, patient's particular health status. And uh, so I think 
the more that we both tap into some of those existing non-genetics uh, infrastructure uh, elements, the, the better off we are. And the more that we think about uh, using that genetic, genetic information as one of many pieces of information about that uh, particular patient, as, uh, as has been mentioned already, uh, the more sophisticated we get at uh, being able to figure out not just what that patient's risk is, but uh, what are some of the behavioral impacts on how that patient uh, either does or does not uh, act on that genetic risk. And so uh, it's partly data infrastructure uh, with that data infrastructure, also including implementation outcomes, but it's also continuing to think about uh, using genetic information in the context of the rest of medical care in a way that uh, can leverage some existing systems. So I'll stop there uh, and uh, looks like we've got a chance to have a discussion. Great, thanks so much. So um, the, the first question that I wanted to just bring up real fast is I know Angela had asked a question about third-party vendor um, genetic services. That is going to be, oh, actually, <laughs> I, I was going to say it looked like that was going to be um, addressed tomorrow in um, Cynthia's talk, but now I'm seeing that it's probably not. So why don't we start there? Um, why do you think um, your rates went down when a third party, when you used a third party gender uh, vendor for genetic services? I can pick it up. Uh... I don't think we saw any risk of doing it. Uh, our finding that the notification rate uh, declined, and I, it might not be a real, a real decline. It simply that may have been that we were simply overzealous doing it initially, although that's what we would like everybody to do. Um, from what we heard from patients, they were extremely satisfied with the level of service and consultation and uh, action plan that were formulated for them. And we saw no problems um, with doing it with a third party vendor uh, compared to, let's say, using our own uh, um, consultants within the organization. Um, however, the rate of successful notification was um, eventually deemed a little bit problematic for, on our part. So just to chime in, we've used um, you know, a mix of our own team as well as third-party genetic services for some of our population results. And I think one of the challenges is when you look at the third parties, it's, it can be harder to um, make the next step for the patient easy. Yes, there can be a recommendation. And even when we said, you know, match sort of the genetic result to who our specific providers are, it was still Okay, you need to call XYZ clinic versus in our system, you have the potential that that scheduling ticket could already be created and it's in almost more of a warm transfer to get to the next step. And I think some of that interoperability is kind of key as we think about how do we move patients to the appropriate next step of their care. I also think some of this comes down sometimes to just basic fairly minor operational issues. So that's one, that, that necessity of making a referral and that warm handoff. But it's also possible that uh, that contact from the third party company isn't recognized by a patient, whereas a contact from your organization would be. And uh, you know we've seen uh, that being by itself a reason enough for those uh, contacts to not be successful. Maybe I can hop in here and, um, I build on that a little bit. So a little bit earlier in uh, the chat, Sandy Aronson at, uh, made, made note of the fact, I think it was the example that Peter gave where um, <clears throat> there was a scheduling, a scheduler issue that uh, affected the quality of outcomes. Um, I, I wonder if the rest of you would be interested in commenting on sort of how do we dig into these sort of operational details of these small little things that actually have a huge impact on the success of the outcomes of uh, genomic medicine in the learning healthcare system. So you may want to take that one on. I think this is where that uh, implementation lens can be really useful and collecting data that are implementation outcomes or the implementation strategies that might be used. 
uh, really rounds out some of the detailed understanding of projects. And so sometimes that can be done by uh, doing semi structured interviews with the individuals engaged in that process, they might be the schedulers or others who are um, along the front lines there. Sometimes it is uh, just watching what happens. Uh, so kind of an observation uh, and someone to play that role and understand the workflow in that setting. Um, but it seems like it's often those sorts of things where the progress breaks down. And so understanding that implementation is, is critical. Yeah, Casey, this seems right up your uh, area. <clears throat> Yeah, I was, I was just going to really add to um, what, a, what Adam was saying, because I, I completely agree. Like, if there were uh, a way to like monitor uh, for unintended consequences using standardized metrics, that's the, um, in a, you know, there's the implement, implementation science frameworks where there are measures that are both um, like qualitative and quantitative. Um, but there are also some like EHR use metrics that might be leveraged to be able to, to monitor regular, regularly, um, as well as things like unintended consequences. Because, um, and I have this, I have an experience where we have a, for example, a telehealth equity work group where we meet regularly and um, discuss findings from a dashboard that shows what's happening with telehealth adoption. And I feel like something similar could be relevant for this use case as well. Uh, Bruce, I, you probably have some uh, in, input on this as well. Yeah, so you know, I would emphasize the importance of really deliberate engagement efforts, and that applies both to the patient community and to the provider community. Um, you know, we know genomics, we think pretty well, but you know, marching in and saying here's how it's going to be done would have been a prescription for failure. What was necessary was to listen and to understand what the concerns were and to make sure that anything we did was sensitive both to the concerns and needs of the patient community and also the provider community. And that needs to be continually monitored and tweaked as, um, as time passes. And Peter. Yeah, so I, I in expanding on sort of how we found out that operational aspect of things, you know, we did have, especially for our primary care uh, initiatives where we wanted to make sure things weren't falling through the cracks. We developed um, Tableau dashboards um, of data and what we would expect the next step would be. But I think one of the challenges is someone has to be monitoring that data or looking at it currently, and that obviously requires some bandwidth. So I think, you know, that is a future iteration that how do we start to bubble up those problems and benchmarks so that um, we become aware of them and it's not someone actually physically having to look at and dive into the, the data because it'll only get more complex of what pathways you're, 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 you're managing or watching. Uh, Mark Williams has his hand up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, just add uh, a couple of things to this discussion. Um, I would certainly endorse uh, uh, Bruce's uh, point about deliberative engagement, but I think there's some tools uh, that can be employed uh, that can be very effective in addressing this specific issue. One is, you know, workflow analysis that can be done um, upfront uh, as a talk through. Uh, to kind of understand from the end user, whether it be patients or providers or both, um, you know, what are the aspects that they're seeing in workflow? We've used our clinician advisory group at Geisinger any number of times to say, we need to return this information to you. We think we should use this function of Epic. And they say, well, we don't look there. We actually use this, which is not exactly what Epic would say is the way you should do it. But by understanding how they're doing it, we can make sure that we don't necessarily throw something into an area where they're not gonna pay attention. And I think a new tool that's really uh, becoming uh, much more effective in implementation science is, a pro is something called process mapping, uh, where we can really look uh, very deep at a very detailed way about the process uh, in a given, uh, for a given workflow and how that process actually varies perhaps depending on clinician location, clinician specialty, uh, et cetera. And if you use that to inform how you build your dashboards, you can then identify process failures much more quickly and remedy them. So those are tools that I think we need to more formally incorporate as we uh, do this in the future. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we've, we've also got a couple more questions. Uh, Angela Bradbury asks, 
How will healthcare systems address the costs of reassessing results and the feedback loop on a regular basis? And, and maybe I'll just broaden that in general. Um, I think Peter, you initially made the point that it's really important to have uh, buy-in from the leadership, but how, how are the sites that you're involved with handling this question of both the upfront costs and then the costs that occur over time? Yeah, so I think, you know, that's an important thing. So we had to rely on initial institution, little support, foundational philanthropy support to get this um, program up and running. And we saw some things in, in terms of having um, um, patient outreach, focus groups, et cetera, what was moving. And we saw some interesting things with patients in our community that they said they were you know, more likely to choose a physician who started to incorporate genomics or genetic testing. Now you had to define what that was in the case of the care to the degree of you know, something like 30%. And you know, our marketing team said, that's a huge move, but we don't see that. Now, whether that's actualized or not, um, that you know, that's a little bit harder to measure, but there are some ways where We've looked at new patients acquired through some of our efforts to promote uh, a quote unquote a more encompassing look at one's health that includes genomics and, and we've had success. You also start to look at, well, doing the right thing by the care of the patient. You know, there's downstream effects of getting patients the right care, you know, the, it, it, um, with BRCA cares and the necessary screening and preventive aspects that um, are evidence-based and guideline-based those all can contribute. So it's something that um, becomes, you start to build that win-win approach from, from the administrative and the clinical care and patient side. Uh, Adam or Bruce, do you wanna add anything to that? One of the things that we have the benefit of at Geisinger is having a health plan that we can ask questions like this to. So some of the questions that Guy raised, for example, about you know, when do you start screening? Uh, we've had a similar experience of identifying risk too late in life. Uh, and so that begs the question of when you screen for certain conditions and at what ages, we can ask our health plan, is there a mechanism that they would use to uh, kind of cover a particular practice for a period of time while we gather necessary evidence, similar to what um, Medicare calls a cover, coverage with evidence determination. Uh, sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no, but it at least allows us a mechanism to say uh, these are technologies that we think will lead to improvements in um, outcomes that are important to the health plan. And uh, is that something that uh, they would support the, a trial of for some period of time? Um, but like Peter, I think we're still in the either institutional or other support as we're trying to gather those data. Guy, do you want to? Do you have anything to add to that about um, the how the costs get covered and what your experience is over time? As the are there increased costs that arise from uh, doing this kind of testing? Um, we've had a lot of buying from the hospital board uh, in general uh, in terms of uh, sponsoring a project, and we've also with the hospital been very creative in. Uh, partnering with uh, industry partners in terms of reducing the cost of the testing. So I wouldn't say that um, we experience increased cost and def definitely we, uh, um, uh, I think we are seen as improving the quality of uh, care within the hospital. Um, so I don't, I don't think that we really are facing that problem so much. In terms of um, following up, and that's going back to uh, previously, part of our consenting uh, process with our participants is that we also have a way of reaching out to them continuously if they consented to, to get their uh, feedback and buy-in into the process and figuring out how to improve it continuously in order to partly reduce, uh, continuously reduce the cost as well. I, I can add, we've had very high level institutional support for this, but it's also a state supported project that we're, we're doing. And I think, you know, the key question for us is going to be sustainability because um, that kind of support is obviously uh, not something you can assume is going to be there forever. And part of the um, implementation science analysis that we're doing is actually looking at what are the outcomes in terms of both quality of care and in terms of costs. So, um, you know, 
I suppose it's possible to imagine coming to the conclusion at the end of the day, it was too expensive and you know, not having sustained state support, it wouldn't survive. But the other side of this is that we have an opportunity to look at how it improves quality of care, both in terms of pharmacogenetics and also in terms of um, recognizing individuals at risk that they may not have known that they had. And I guess, you know, we'll see what those results are, but that's the whole premise of this is to show that it really improves quality and at least is cost neutral, if not Im improving that. Maybe we can pivot a little bit. Um, there are several questions that have come up in the chat and on the Q&A related to health disparities and um, whether we're accelerating the problem of health disparities uh, through these relatively expensive approaches. Uh, anybody want to comment on how we make sure that uh, we develop an equitable plan? Uh, Bruce, you said you actually you had a fairly large population of underserved in, in your study. Um, but I think this question of health disparities and then more broadly, the social determinants of health as a, as a counterpart to the genomics. So people want to comment on that? You know, so it turns out that our, I would say most robust um, enrolling site is in Selma, um, which serves a, um, a very generally underserved population, um, largely black and African-American. Um, and the uptake has been extremely enthusiastic. And I, I attribute that mainly to the really close working relationship that the staff of the clinic have with their patient population. And as I mentioned, we do have a community advisory board. So we really haven't found it to be um, so difficult to engage people if we understand what their concerns are and, and try to address them. But I will say, you know, one sort of key point here is that for example, we provide the results in a, you know, a written, essentially PDF printout, which is a pretty low tech solution. And we're very tempted to build apps and, you know, other kinds of um, web-based things that people can use to get access to their information. The problem is that internet access in that part of the state is spotty at best and sometimes completely non-existent. Uh, people very often don't have smartphones, never mind um, any other mechanism of internet access. So if you want to increase disparities, put everything on the web and tell people that's the modern way to get information. And in our community, that would not work for a very significant percentage. But if we do it in a way that works for them, then we have found people really quite interested. I would like just to add that what we have observed, we have disparities as well. It's very, it's, it's clearly obvious. Um, but what we have observed that if you have a community champion, it really, really does help in the increasing recruitment uh, in underserved communities. As for our communication methods, we also observed that the success uh, notification rate was clearly higher for. Um, people of European descent compared to others. And that's probably because of uh, exactly that uh, ability to uh, owning, owning phones and uh, communication methods that are more available to the, uh, or less available to the underserved. Uh, Peter, I think you were up next. Sure, yes. Yeah. So we've started to take a look at this um, with some primary or some um, personalized medicine driven um, initiatives. Um, uh, we acquired a, 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 a safety net hospital in Illinois, a Swedish hospital, and we have some clinics that are fully in the preferred uh, language. And we've gone in and, um, you know, using some mixed method, um, uh, mixed method studies, uh, looked at the not only from the uh, physician perspective and the providers there, their thoughts on this, how they see the barriers, and then also um, community engagement. And we actually did some novel outreach as a result of it that historically North Shore hasn't done. As our program has evolved, we started to recognize too that you know um, social determinants, health disparities is, is well, it, it can be um, exacerbated by genomics. It's not just a genomics problem as well. And so we have started to take the approach 
uh, well, where are, are, um, where are some things that are lying more broadly in our organization that we're trying to solve? For example, uh, mammography screening rates um, within our organization. That's something that we are, are tackling. We have pockets where the compliance is not there. Well, part of the health screening or breast screening um, can involve genomics. And so how do we increase access to mammography? And at the same time, we've leveraged some of our learnings in the primary care and now um, deploy a more targeted um, population screening approach at our mammography offerings, where when you go in for a screening mammography, you get a structured questionnaire and it tees up just like at the primary care visit, whether you may be indicated to have genetic testing or not, and our team helps supervise it. So trying to find those common channels in the organization, because our team is relatively small, um, we're not gonna, it's gonna be much harder for us to have an impact across our broader organization if we don't try to find these other organizational priorities for social determinants and, and solving the disparity issues. Casey? Oops, I'm trying to lower my hand. Um, thanks. So, so I just wanted to uh, make a note about genomics in general because there, the idea is that um, it, a lot of genomic discovery has happened in uh, European populations, and so the findings may be uh, more. Uh, those groups may may benefit more than some other groups, and so uh, just emphasizing being able to monitor like who's benefiting. Um, and if anybody is not benefiting as much, so that can help to guide uh, discovery research. Um, monitoring uh, race, and I, I know we're in genomics, we say like maybe use uh, not to use race as much, but for uh, monitoring for disparities, it's important to, to look at race. Uh, and, um, and also uh, it's the genomic test results as well as other clinical data that goes into rules. And so there may be, uh, several people talked about clinical documentation. Uh, in the EHR, if there are patients in some groups that don't visit the doctor as often because they're not insured or something like that, then their clinical data is less complete. And so when you take rules that have both clinical and genomic data together, that can impact also um, how well uh, like a, a rule or, or an algorithm performs. And so these are, these are all kind of considerations uh, that can lead to uh, uh, disparities ultimately. And so, uh, so back to the, just monitoring for those kinds of issues. Adam. I echo Peter's point about um, making things easy within the flow of care. Um, you know, when we think about how previous referral guidelines for genetic counseling or testing have uh, set really specific criteria for who should have that, uh, it, it does, increase the number of steps that patients need to go through to get that information. So when we kind of democratize that and uh, take more of a universal screening approach, we can decrease some of those uh, steps and that can be helpful. And so if you have fewer patients fall out along the way. Um, but I think to Casey's point, the evidence base is really critical. Uh, one example from ClinGen, uh, from an actionability perspective for secondary findings is uh, that when we took a look at uh, G6PD, we realized that the evidence base there was not nearly as robust as we thought it would be based on how we were all trained and what, what we thought we knew in terms of the um, types of guidelines and other uh, evidence that's considered to be really robust evidence. And so uh, when we are kind of doing downstream activities that rely on uh, that imperfect evidence or incomplete evidence, then uh, it really does run the risk of exacerbating the health disparities and going back and being really clear about how data were generated uh, and who's missing from that data generation, I think is gonna be really critical. Uh, I think One another- We have about eight minutes left for wrap up and, and wrap up. Yeah, another uh, thing that has come up in the chats and discussion um, <clears throat> is the question of um, transferability between health systems. People don't necessarily spend their whole life in a single health system. Uh, they come and go. And um, how important is it? I mean, it's obviously going to be very important to address that problem of interoperability. We're, I think, a long way from that at this point. Um, any thoughts about how we do a better job of that? Really, that's an issue that goes way beyond genomics. Um, yeah. 
it, you know, genomics is the least of our problems with interoperability. Um, just getting imaging data or, or simple medical records can sometimes be an impossibly difficult challenge. Casey, were you going to comment on that? Yeah, I was just, I was going to say that uh, in the thread, there's um, some, I, I added a comment about putting genomics in the hands of the patient, um, where like going from one one site to another that might help with uh, consistency in data. And I, um, there are others that can probably speak to that more than, than I can. Uh, the other issue related to portability is in like software solutions. And that is, um, that is where standards become important. Um, but there, you know, there are some additional uh, requirements locally to be able to implement standards som sometimes for software solutions. So, um, so that that is just something to to keep in mind for uh, for software projects. And Peter, it, it's a real issue. I think it really was highlighted. So we have um, uh, merged with a couple other organizations in the Chicago land. There are also Epic shops, but they're on different instances of epic so even when you have the same emr a lot of what we built um, we can't just kind of implement right away even if we wanted to um, it's a little bit why we developed what's called our, our, our flight software our own sort of repository that helps run clinical decision support so that we can get data in and out from a variety of different sources but i'm fortunate that we had a very talent or have a very talented team to do that that's not scalable and i think Finally, we're starting to get you know more traction and attention from um, from the major vendors, but um, a lot of this is going to have to be done in, in in discussion with them if we're really going to have interoperability. I think. And Mark, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a really critical issue. I'm hoping uh, this did come up some at uh, GM13, so I'm hoping that Ken Wiley will uh, cover a little bit of this in his uh, talk. But I do uh, want to take one point of um, uh, discussion away from what Bruce said, um, where he said um, that this was the genomics was the least of the problem. I would argue that it may be a slightly uh, more important problem than things like labs and imaging, and that has to do with the persistence of the information over time. You know, a lot of the uh, information that we uh, generate through transactional electronic health records, like laboratory data, imaging data, et cetera, is relevant for a certain period of time or episode of care, but it may not have relevance uh, uh, persistently. Whereas genomic information, at least in theory, has the ability to be uh, relevant throughout an entire lifespan. Mm -hmm. And so I do think there are some aspects of having this um, uh, in the hands of the patient in some way, so it travels with the patient across the lifespan, that's going to be critically important and should be an area of emphasis for research. Mark, just, I, I definitely take your point. I, I think my point really was that by far the most common reasons you want to see medical records are not so much genomics as just, you know, simple, who put this patient on this medicine? And even that we right now struggle to get just, you know, at the moment, in spite of intentions otherwise, maybe medical records remain an incredibly siloed um, kind of enterprise. I see we have a hand up from um, Pat Maha. Sorry if I butchered your name, but go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Are you able to? I allowed her to talk, but I'm not so sh sure that they're there. Okay. Uh, Terry, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, well, I think it, several times in, in this discussion, the issue of sort of monitoring and assessing how things are happening has, has come up. And Peter, you made a comment about currently having to do that kind of monitoring manually and, and obviously wanting to make it automated. Have you had success in making it automated or is there a pathway to, to make that happen? So that's something that we're trying to, to look at and see what can um, elevate it. Uh, it's more honestly a, a manual process still where at least we're getting more of the reporting automated so that you can see trend lines quickly and you can identify where things may be going differently. Um, this has been important as we see, looked at turnaround times for labs that are going out and coming back. Um, so some, some um, 
initial baby steps in implementation, but I think there, there's certainly more work to, to be done there. Adam? We focused early on trying to automate phenotyping, um, both through Emerge and through some later activities, but now we're more focused on trying to automate the performance of the recommended management that's based on that genetic information. And that's just as time intensive and manual to begin with as, as the other processes. But once you get there, the goal is to have the ability to dashboard that information so that you can see that your cohort of uh, patients with a particular genetic risk are either on track or not on track and drill down on those who are not on track uh, for that uh, management so that you can uh, then intervene accordingly. Uh, that's doable um, with some validation processes for looking at uh, CPT codes, for example, but uh, it just, it takes time to, to build that out. And we've kind of taken a, a few diseases that we're focused on first, and then we'll expand that later. All right, well, I think we're coming up to the end of our time. Um, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for a really terrific discussion. I think there are, for me, there were a few important uh, themes that emerged here. Um, one was the importance of making sure that we're monitoring the uptake of recommendations and making sure that we're doing whatever we can to improve the quality of that. I think another big theme that uh, emerged was the importance of making sure that we, we do no harm, that we're both increasing the diversity of the uh, evidence base that we have. Uh, I know there's a lot of interest in NHGR and expanding to uh, sort of non-European populations to better uh, track the variance of unknown significance and the variance of known significance um, or potential significance. Um, I think making sure that we're paying attention to merging genomic data with not only other clinical data, but with um, social determinants of health. And I think that's going to be an important area of opportunity for us uh, going forward. And then we, we've also heard a lot about the economics of this process. And uh, I think sustainability, Bruce made the important point that sustainability of this is going to be really important going forward and we're going to need to figure that out um, and we're going to need we, we you know I know the, the genomic medicine working group has tried to engage payers in this process and um, I think there's a lot more work to be done there in terms of persuading payers to help cover some of these costs so I, I think uh, and then finally um, building on the work of Casey and others about the use of electronic health records and how do we better improve electronic health records, both to integrate genomic data into them and then to actually broaden the utility of that data once it's present in the electronic health records. So I think lots of things for us to work on. And I know we're gonna hear more about many of these topics in the course of the next uh, two days. So again, I appreciate everything from the panelists in terms of setting us up for a really great discussion during the rest of the meetings. So thanks to the panelists. And I think we're now going to schedule to take a 10 minute break. So hopefully we'll see everybody back here in 10 minutes. <clears throat>